Welcome to our panel debate on artificial intelligence. Our team of experts will look at the impact of artificial intelligence now and in the future and the impact it's going to have on the engineering technology sector and beyond. We've got a fabulous panel with us today and I'll let them introduce themselves. And I will start with uh, Nadia Abuyu from the University of London. Nadia, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Um, hello, nice to see you all and thank you very much for having me um, in this panel um, virtually because of, uh, of post-COVID. So, um, so yes, so currently I'm a lecturer um, on the newly created Master in Data of Science, which is something I'm really passionate about in order to prepare the future um, generation and the future of the workforce. Um, but mainly as well, I'm a strategist in innovation in banking uh, with more than 15 years in uh, investment banking, working on pricing risk. And my last role was as the strategist improvement lead and uh, looking at regulations, uh, implementation of regulations within uh, in our institution and working with our C-suite to implement our innovations as well. So I'm looking forward to the debate and especially um, to see the experience from, um, from the industry, um, the different areas of industry. So looking forward to it. Great, thank you. Okay, next, uh, Professor Nick Colosimo uh, from uh, BA Systems. Nick. Thank you. Uh, so principal technologist for disruptive technologies, which includes AI and autonomy more generally, and also lead engineer for the future combat air system as far as technology is concerned. So I'm really a, a systems engineer, part physicist, part technologist, part, part futurist. Uh, I've been in the business of aerospace, defense and security for about 31 years been flying autonomous systems for the best part of uh, 20 years. So that's me. Right, thanks, Nick. Uh, next, Josh Martin from MathWorks. Tim, thanks very much for having us. Uh, so my name is Josh. I'm a director of engineering here at MathWorks with responsibility for parallel computing and cloud platform integration. Uh, obviously, Parallel computing also incorporates all of our GPU work, which, in, which is therefore very, very related to AI. Um, so I also own some core parts of MATLAB, virtual file systems, interaction with the cloud. Prior to joining MathWorks, I was an academic uh, in the physics area, and I'm you know, hugely interested in what the panel has to say about what the future of AI is and how people can use it effectively, mostly engineers and scientists. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joss. Uh, over to Jack Marshall from Beckhoff. Hi, thanks for having us, Tim. Um, I work for Beckhoff Automation as an applications engineer, which uh, does mean I put stickers on my laptop. It also means I help out our customers um, ranging, you know, making decisions on machine builds, uh, ranging from everything from network connected PLCs all the way through to machine vision systems in large complex automated factories. Thank you. Okay, and finally, for the panel, we have Dr. Philip Clark, DSpace. Hi there. Thanks very much uh, for uh, inviting us along to this debate here today. I work for a company called DSpace. Uh, we work predominantly in the automotive and aerospace sector for the verification and validation of embedded systems in vehicles and aircraft. Um, and we've got a particular interest in, uh, in AI when it comes to the verification and validation of the more sophisticated systems that are now being introduced into those domains, particularly the area of advanced driver system autonomous vehicles. Uh, we have um, technologies that use artificial intelligence to make sure that the, uh, we select the testing criteria very carefully. In those industries, uh, testing is very important. There's a lot of testing to be done and we need technology that's able to reduce that. And my background is um, I'm originally a mathematician and I spent 25 years in the area of embedded systems. Right. Okay, Philip. Well, thank you very much. Well, I thought we'd start by having a look at what AI actually is and what it means to each of us, because uh, AI is a, as a term is, is thrown around very, uh, very lightly and very loosely these days. So I wonder if I could ask each of you in, in turn to uh, describe what, uh, define what AI means to you. Uh, Nadia, can I start with you? I'll go in the same order. <laughs> all right, okay. So um, regarding the definition, so first of all, in your, your question, you said, is the term AI thrown around too lightly? I think um, there is an in, um, it is important to be able to 
democratize AI and to understand what AI stands for and what is its evolution as well. Um, so regarding the definition of AI, I would like to go back to its mm. founder. Um, so John McCarty, who is the founder of the Dharma Conference in uh, 1956, and he defined it as AI, artificial intelligence, being the science and engineering of making the machine intelligent. So you start with this concept, and obviously we has evolved, and there's so many different elements uh, regarding the development of that intelligence. And the second part I would say regarding if we're looking at definition is to look at Arthur Samuel, its definition of machine learning, which is a, a, a methodology to be able to help to make the machine intelligence. And he defines it as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So that is really to help to move towards the prediction, but as well to learn from its experience. So if we look at terminology, this is what AI is. Now, what do we? What are the challenges that we see nowadays? Is sometimes AI is used for certain fields which are not really related to AI. Uh, for example, you must have heard about RPA, so robotic process automation, and a lot of people say that AI is RPA is AI, and actually it is not probably not the version that we have now, saying that a lot of the companies who are developing RPAs and sometimes called as robots, but people as well, again, confuse that with physical robots, but they're not. Um, but in these companies who are developing the RPA, now on their um, uh, development product roadmap, they are looking at integrating uh, libraries and algorithms. So in the future generation of RPAs, there may be some components of AI in there. So I think if we look at AI itself as it is right now, I think it's important to uh, classify what is AI, what is not AI, and to understand its root um, and its history as well. Okay, well, well, we'll jump back to that in just a, a, a moment. Um, uh, Nick, maybe I, I could ask you to, uh, to expand on that uh, as well. And particularly maybe that point is that uh, machine learning is, AI is quite often described as uh, uh, machine learning and vice versa, but they're, they're not quite the same things, are they? There's, there's no genuine intelligence in uh, machine learning. It's, it's such a tough question, Tim, and I agree with many of, of Nadia's points just, just earlier. Um, I like to kind of take a step back from, from this and say, what are we really interested in? We're really interested in solving quite complex tasks where those complex tasks would normally take a biological intelligence to resolve them. So anything which can do that, I would... I would class as artificial intelligence. And that includes everything from logic and automated reasoning through to statistical learning methods, through to search optimization, and all the way to deep learning, including deep neural networks. So I would, I would, I would kind of throw it all in there because you know, we as, as, as humans, whilst we've got this sophisticated neural network, which gives us this uh, perceptual intelligence Right. It's not just about the perceptual intelligence. It's about the, the logic we use, the automated reasoning, the if this, then that type rules that we apply in our brains uh, every, every day. That, for me, is, is still uh, a form of, of artificial intelligence if we were to embody similar principles in, in machines. So, so I, I, I would be probably a little bit cautious about... Uh, making the, uh, the, the the assumption that the machine has to be as intelligent as a, a person to, to get the label of artificial intelligence. It simply needs to solve the task at hand, a task which would normally take a biological intelligence, animal or human, to be able to solve the problem. Okay, Josh, I, I, I think I, I'm not, not sure if we're defining what uh, AI is as, mu as much as what AI isn't at the moment, but uh, go, go over to you. So I, I'm going to take a very similar tack to Nick. Um, and in fact, let's get rid of the artificial first. Let's just say, what is intelligence? And actually, if we each think about what is intelligence, it is an experience of something else, another human, another biological system that appears to exhibit a set of behaviors that we attribute to intelligence. Um, maybe 
Many of you think I'm intelligent. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I may or may not be. But uh, uh, to some degree, under some circumstances, I give that an impression. So uh, like Nick, systems that are artificial, that under some circumstances exhibit something like what we term intelligence should be deemed artificial intelligence systems. And I think there are many of them. Um, I think even computers just programmed ordinarily. If you think back to the invention of the Turing test, there were moments when it was very, very difficult to tell that that computer just programmed by a human wasn't artificially intelligent. So artificial intelligence is this huge set of things. It encompasses an enormous amount of stuff. I would, to, I would conjecture that this thing that we call machine learning is necessarily a subset of artificial intelligence. It is within it. It is a particular type of artificial intelligence where we have the tendency to give data to a well-known or well-defined thing, a bit like a generalized template of a model, and you go and get machine learned models out of it. Inside machine learning, I believe you have deep learning. It is a type of deep learning, a type of machine learning, where you happen to have a particular type of sets of models and you have to give a particular type of sets of data and you can train them. So certainly in my world, I think of, a, I think artificial intelligence is bandied around and isn't hugely meaningful. I think what you really want to start talking about are machine learning and deep learning, and there are other types of things. And those are the interesting things for today's AI because AI, because AI in the general has been around since the 50s or even earlier. Um, and so, you know, it's very hard to say what that means. That would be, that would be my thoughts on it. Well, could, could I uh, venture that maybe there, there is a, if you're going down machine learning, then it's, uh, you know how you're going to be using the data. If you're going down the neural networks, then you're, uh, it's got a life of its own to a certain extent and uh, you're not defining it in quite the same way. Well, what would your feelings be, Jack? So <clears throat> I agree with Joss and Nick here that the um, <clears throat> machine learning is you know, definitely a subset of AI and AI is a very broad and encompassing topic that's maybe quite hard to define in a nice snippy soundbite. So um, you know, we've seen historically things like if statements being used to perform things that may seem intelligent, they might just be novel to the observer. Um, so when we're looking at stuff like that, we consider whether it would be possible to do with a person programming it, right? So if, uh, if we've got stuff that is now achievable only through machine learning. So things like the energy optimization of transport systems um, and center prediction and stuff like that that can take that needs to take place at a speed faster than human comprehension that is able to remove potentially expensive hardware and is only achievable by using neural networks and machine learning to provide that goal. And that that for me is what I see as the not the next step, but is what is typically defined as modern artificial intelligence, I would define as machine learning. Okay, well, again, that aspect of how quick it is and can humans keep up is something I'll ask uh, uh, some of you in just a, a moment. But uh, Philip, have, have you got anything to, to add on uh, your definitions of AI? I mean, I think what we've seen is everybody has a definition of AI. Uh, there's been some very good definitions that have just come before us. Um, from our perspective, really, at the very simplistic level, it's the it's artificial in intelligence is where you um, you allow machines to think for themselves. You allow them to have that decision making process. And coming from the embedded systems industry, that's always something that we've been obviously with safety criticality in mind, reluctant to do, reluctant to give those machines too much choice. So for a long time, the type of embedded systems decision processes were based upon what I call algorithms. You knew. Um, what the ultimate outcome uh, was going to be. I used to work with jet engines and there was no way that we were going to let the decision process go outside of a well-defined envelope of behavior. But nowadays with more complex systems and more complex requirements, we're having to introduce heuristic behavior into the systems. In other words, we don't really know. We could give them a set of criteria, but we're not absolutely sure what decision they're going to take. 
In the past, we knew what decision they were going to take and hoped it was the best. Now we're saying, we think that the decision that they will take will be better because there's a, an element of um, um, statistical input. There's an element of chance, as it were. Um, and there are challenges, certainly, within the safety critical systems industry of getting that trade off between is that a better decision that we would have got from an algorithm and or is that going to be worse? Are we going to improve or not? And those are the challenging questions uh, that we think face the industry in the next few years, particularly in automotive and aerospace. Okay. Um, Nadia, I wonder if I could ask you to, uh, you, you mentioned uh, quite a bit about the importance of understanding the history and the evolution of, uh, of, of AI as to where we are at the moment. I wonder if you, you would mind just uh, expanding it, uh, give us a, a whistle-stop tour of the, the history and evolution of, of AI. Yeah, um, just to add on, on what everyone's been saying, and it's, it's nice to see that you know, um, from AI, there's so many different um, elements that we need to take into account. Uh, one thing that I want to, another dimension that I wanted to add is what we call the narrow AI and AGI, which is part of the definition of AI. So the narrow AI is actually, in, in simple term, is how to make a system um, very good to be able to do a certain task. And um, all the examples that we have right now, we're talking about narrow AI. We may hear, if you might hear or read in articles about AGI, which is general AI, and we talk about singularity, this is a different aspect of AI. So as you can see, um, there's an AI that incorporates very different elements, but um, everything that we're going to discuss today and that has been covered by my peers, it's uh, related to narrow AI, i.e. making, um, you know, making uh, one task or several tasks, but doing it really well using some machines. And um, regarding the history, I think last time when we had a quick chat um, all together, and I think Nick, you mentioned about the winters of, of AI, and I'm glad you did, because this is so important to understand our history as a science and where we came from and how it evolves. So as I mentioned earlier on, on 1956 with John McCarty, Arthur Samuel in Dartmouth, where there was the first, they were called the fathers of artificial intelligence. We know about Alan Turing's and uh, his famous papers in the, in the 30s. So um, it's all these steps that are actually building in how to make a machine help you to do a human task and how to make it intelligence. As this was nicely defined by, by everyone um, early on. And the reason why I said it's important to understand our history is because when it's new, there's this, um, uh, we're looking forward to it. And then there's a, as well, we need to educate people. And sometimes people expect so much from a system Whereas they are, um, the system is not possible to, to provide. So for example, when you talk about algorithm and prediction, not all algorithms are correct. Not all prediction are going to be correct. We need to be aware of the limitation of the system. And I know that uh, later we will be talking about this. And when we look back at the history of AI, we will see these winters of AI. And what does the winters of AI means? It means the time where this appetite for technology and AI has uh, disappeared because of issues that we had or expectation that haven't been met. So, and we had many of them throughout um, the last 40, 50 years, 60 years actually. And it's important to understand because the companies that we have now, some of them have AI within, as I always say, in their DNA. So it's part of their business processes. Some others um, have more legacy systems, but they're looking at implementing AI in their systems. So the impact of this winters going forward maybe a little bit bigger so it is important to educate everyone about what AI can and can do and then we mentioned about um, AI is not the solution to every problem we have to look at the problem and see what is the best solution for it. Okay well I certainly wouldn't think that we're in a, in a winter situation at the moment there's a, a very a, a lot of positivity about the, the possibilities of AI at the moment maybe that's something Nick, you would uh, care to address the uh, the trends at the moment. Where where are we where are we at and where are we going now? So so I think everyone would agree that the machines are getting better. They're getting smarter. And when we talked about artificial intelligence, we talked about machine learning and the subset of machine learning, which is which is deep learning. And many of the major gains that we've seen recently 
have been in the deep learning field. Um, and that's been possible because we've had much more affordable processing power, more data, really useful uh, tools like uh, MATLAB, like um, the Anaconda suite, you know, a whole range of, of things that we can just just leverage, right? So we, we've really democratized the whole the whole topic, right? But there is a dark side, there is a downside that uh, as as much as the advancements that have been made through deep learning and as as good as they they they've really been and I think they've really surprised a lot of of people in machine vision right the way through to uh, playing games like Go, which is uh, exceptionally uh, complex. Um, these systems have become increasingly opaque, black box in nature. We can't see inside them very well. Very difficult to explain, and that's presented a real problem, I think, for. Um, many industries, including aerospace and defense in, in particular, because we want to leverage this high performing capability, but we also need to be able to either explain it or formally police it in, in, some, in some way. Um, I guess the other, the other dark side, which is, which is probably worth a, a mention here, is that these systems do require increasingly large amounts of data to perform the, the training. Or if it's a re deep reinforcement learning algorithm, many, many test runs, if you will, in order to, to perfect the, 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 the solution. So that's a challenge. And they're not particularly robust yet, uh, as well as lacking this explainability. And that was exposed by these things that we call generative adversarial networks, which uh, have been shown to expose deep learning image classifiers um, as not really picking out the features that that we would associate with why that's an ostrich versus a school bus, for example. So I think the the big things that we we can expect uh, looking forward are are much more robust, explainable artificial intelligence that requires very little training data, what we might refer to as one-shot learning. And there are solutions out there which are being developed at the moment, which are on the pathway to artificial general intelligence through the likes of Dr. Simon Stringer um, at Applied AGI. And so there's, there's work happening already, uh, novel types of neural networks, ensembles, where we, where we take some uh, first order logic knowledge based systems, we combine them with neural networks, we might then combine them with decision trees, and a whole, um, a whole mashup, if you will, to get the best out of each of the worlds from each of these different aspects of, of artificial intelligence. Now to catalyze all of that, we are going to need much greater computational power because the amount of compute power required for training seems to be going up exponentially. And it's going up at a higher rate than what Moore's law is, is also growing. And therefore there's a risk of divergence here. And we're just starting to see a few glimmers of that. So we're going to need not only new software architectures, but new hardware devices, neuromorphic computing, quantum computing, for example. And we're going to have to, have to invest heavily, I think, in the neuromorphic devices, the brains on a chip, if you will, um, largely, uh, largely because we want high performance per unit size, weight and power, high performance per unit cost, because we want these devices in smartphones. We want artificial intelligence at the edge. And the only way we're going to get that is through um, some investment and greater leverage of new types of hardware type devices. And, and I think these are necessary catalysts to see the next breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. And, and I, I probably should also mention quantum computing in the mix for that as well. Oh, quantum computing is interesting, isn't it? Because it's, uh, we don't know how stable it is. It's, it's good for processing, but not good for storage. And uh, there's got to be a, a marry up in what you're saying that the amount of data that is required for AI, it, it doesn't necessarily fall into the strengths of, uh, of quantum computing. Well, so, so quantum computing, I guess, is really about optimization and, and many of the, the, the problems that we're faced with, uh, including neural, neural networks and back pro propagation, we're really optimizing the, the, the solution. And, and in theory, this is what quantum computing is, is, is good at. So, so I, I expect we'll, we'll see some new leaps forward as we finally get commercial quantum computing online in the next decade.
Right, I'm going to uh, jump back to something you, you said in the Nick, and I'll put this one to, uh, to Philip because it's something that he touched on as, uh, as well. And, and that's the, uh, the, there are a lot of issues uh, with, with AI, perceptual issues perhaps about the, uh, how much we can trust it, these, how much we can control it. Because uh, like I think you said, Philip, then it is making decisions far faster than a, a human being can check those decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, in, perhaps in the test industry as, uh, as you're involved in, uh, you see that throwing up uh, big issues? I do. I mean, it was interesting to see what uh, Nick said. And one of the interesting points he made was the idea of being able to draw a lot out of a reduced set of data. You see, as is obvious in the embedded systems and the um, safety critical area, we are naturally conservative. We are worried about the decisions that the artificial intelligence engines are going to make. And we want to make sure that they fit within an acceptable envelope. And so what we have at the moment in the area of, for, for example, autonomous driving is a data crisis. What we say is we need so much data to be able to reach a level of assurance that these vehicles will drive safely, that it's almost impossible to be able to um, uh, to be able to process this data through the various algorithms. I'll come up with a self-driving algorithm, which I think is a good candidate to release on the roads, but I have to push so much data into this um, to make sure that it behaves uh, as expected. And while we read about Google's autonomous vehicles and um, the Uber autonomous fleet and all the individual autonomous vehicles that are out on the road, in the industry we know that that level of testing, having real vehicles on the road, has to be augmented by a much larger cloud-based testing capability where we're pushing these huge amounts of data. Now, when it comes to that data, we have two problems. Problem number one is ground truth data. I can take a video of a car driving around the roads, but do I really know that that thing in front of it is a pedestrian or it's a zebra crossing or whatever? And I have to match the data that I'm pulling off data acquisition devices like radar and LIDAR, I have to match that to what I really know is there, that's a real pedestrian. And the other thing is the sheer volume of data that we have to put through and the repetitive nature of that data. So because we're conservative, we want to make sure that the vehicle will come across, that the vehicle algorithm has been tested in all the circumstances that may come across or all possible reasonable circumstances. And that's where we see artificial intelligence uh, at the moment. We think it may be the slightly less, uh, more pedestrian or and less prosaic uh, um, type of, uh, uh, of testing, but we're looking at using artificial intelligence to reduce the amount of data that we put into the machines, not because we want the algorithms to work on a small amount of data, but because in terms of the speed of execution of the algorithms, we really need to be able to get all the interesting data through and exercises as much as possible. So it is interesting to hear you talk about reducing the amount of data. We want to increase the amount of data, but increase its density of interest, if you see what I mean. Yeah, actually, if I could pick up on that, Tim, I, I was interested, Nick, you were saying that you're thinking about having AI systems that can be trained on virtually no data. And that scares me enormously. I think, think about how much information we, these five, six AI people have been trained on. We, we were not A. We've been trained on an enormous amount of data. And I think the only way that systems can be stable is if they do have a lot of information content that they're trained on. And actually, what Phil is saying is really interesting. It may be that we don't give them raw data. It may be that we train AI systems on other AI systems. But those other AI systems have an enormous amount of information content about the things that are interesting. Cool. And I, well, it would be perhaps interesting to debate whether or not we all agree that we must at least train systems on large amounts of information content rich stuff. Mm. Maybe that's an AI system that's taken other data that has condensed it and then can generate other data that is information rich. But I do think that we can't actually run in a system where there is very little original data. That would be scary. Yeah, so yes, I, I would. So, so I, I'm going to say something controversial, uh, Josh. So, uh, so I, 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 I assumed I, you would do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I guess in in a way we've we've put ourselves into this this cul-de-sac through the methods that we've chosen. So the, for example, these very very deep neural networks. For example, if we were to pick on that as an example, and 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 so we have to. Um, 
pass massive amounts of, of image data through to them in order to, to train them to recognize what a giraffe looks like, for example. But if, if you pass a giraffe toy to a child for a few seconds, that child will know what a giraffe looks like thereafter, but in many, many cases, dependent upon the age of the, of the child. So something different is going on within, uh, within the human brain. And the neuroscientists would refer to this as the feature binding problem, right? There are no solutions, no artificial intelligence solutions yet to the feature binding problem as, as we see in primates and has been widely, widely studied. If we can crack that, then for that aspect, that subset of image classification, which is only a subset, Josh. So, you know, I, oh, yeah. I do take you, take your point fully, you know, for regression systems and, and so on. Um, but, you know, there, there, there is a different way of thinking about it ultimately. Uh, I wasn't really saying that. I was saying even if we had a model that exhibited the feature binding problem, I still conjecture it would take a lot of data to train mm. it. So I, it, it, I wasn't really getting yeah. at current systems needing a lot of data. I think all systems now and in the future mm. will always need a lot of data. Well, and I'm going to be constricting it to they need information rich data whatever yeah. that may be and i yeah. you know and i think what phil's Agreed. getting at is that we have to have ways of not just flooding them with originating data but having ways of concentrating the information often in mm -hmm. ai systems or other training set scenarios yeah that's fair i, I mean it's a, it, it is a challenge in the automotive industry getting that removing boring data is what we we, we say as a kind of shortcut to it we want to throw away the boring data because your car is quite happy driving along the M1 all the way. It's when it comes off and onto the junctions that are the interesting things. Okay, Nadia? Yeah. yeah so um, I'm actually glad that we start talking about data and not only about algorithm, because I think it's very important to realize that the data itself, there are so many challenges, and we want to have time today, but there's so many challenges and it related to the data, the understanding of the data, the sources of the data and how we manage that. So what recommendation, and I'm sure, um, as Philip, you know, what Josh said about the importance of the data and, and, and yourself, Nick, I think what is important to uh, remember for anyone who's, who are interested in application, applications of AI is to understand your, your data and you understand your own word because we talk about artificial intelligence but looking at the diversity in our in our panel we're applying ai to different industry and the way that we apply it is is very different we have our own regulation philippe met talked about um the for the autonomous cars uh, we have regulation in the banking industry nick got in defense manufacturing was jag you know um so it is important to understand going forward so we have artificial intelligence we have our own industry what is the data in our own industry? Sometimes there will be some overlaps, sometimes there won't be. But it's, um, I'm glad that we're starting discussing uh, data and there's so much about data we can talk about, about the challenges, uh, how to train the algorithm, how much data we have, the bias, the, the, the um, and most important as well, let's never forget about the cleansing of your data. And that's why I always say to my students, understand your data. That is a key thing and then you can look about your algorithm as well. Okay. So that's the key point I wanted to add. I would, I would, uh, if we're looking at the, the, the data, we could bring in you, Jack, here. We haven't heard, heard from you yet. Was, uh, and the way I framed this question to start with was about trust. And, and clearly that is as much about trusting the data as trusting the, uh, the algorithms. Uh, the, the world of uh, manufacturing and automation, I, I would, uh, really lends itself to uh, uh, certain ways of collecting that data that you can uh, trust, analyze, and uh, put through various algorithms. Yeah, absolutely, Tim. Um, so we, like the, one of the biggest challenges we see with people undertaking projects is, is actually trying to even define what sort of Tra training data that they actually need to collect um, and how how they go about doing that is actually a fairly simple problem once you've simple problem to solve once you've defined what you actually need to collect and there, there are some yeah 
fundamental uh you know things that you you can't do you can't create data if there's no you can't create like a value if there's no source of it right the, the, there are there are things that we're doing with narrow ai so very specific tasks where we can ideally train on data sets that are collected in the order of hours and days rather than over weeks and months and we're talking physical processes here not um not things like image classification so we've got we got to wait for stuff to heat up and cool down and things like that so there are limits as to how quickly we can collect it um and yeah you know, i mean we could try and simulate that but you know the the rules of you know physics do limit us to some degree so when we're when we're looking at sort of collecting that um yeah i've Got a bit off topic here into data collection and massively off of trust, but yeah, that's uh, that's 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 the that's the challenge for us. Trust for us is, I see that more of a future problem because uh, certainly in manufacturing, people are only really looking at narrow AI and they are able to constrain that with conventionally programmed safety systems uh, that will avoid any they'll be using it for a very specialist task that they can control using other means okay um well if we're looking at a broader issue of the uh, broader ai rather than narrow ai then uh, maybe this is one for you nadia that uh, ai can make decisions about people's lives in the in the fintech world for example it's uh, whether the computer says yes or or no uh, have we got the, the necessary uh, regulations in place to make sure that it's uh, it's fair and ethical? Um, so, so many, um, as we said, um, AI has so many challenges, but it's an interesting time right now because we're building um, the AI that we'll be using tomorrow and we can today shape it and that one of the shaping is actually related to the regulations so what we expect the understanding of the terminologies so for example on your question so let's start with the more general aspects so about the ethics and the regulations related to um, the application of AI in the industries Interestingly enough, right now, there is a talk at the ITU who has been taking for quite a while and a very keen interest on AI and the application of AI, um, ITU being the telecommunication body of the United Nations. And they're having right now an, an exceptional webinars on AI policy on autonomous vehicles. And um, Philip mentioned earlier on the, about autonomous vehicles and that's why I thought it would be nice to reference that. And the work they're doing right now, for example, you, you mentioned about the ethics and uh, apl um, application of AI and the challenges. And they're working right now on the AI policy standards and matrix and uh, looking at the data. You talked early on, uh, Nick and Philip, about the data for the training of the autonomous cars. So this is one aspect being done on the manufacturing side. And that's why I said, it's very good to look at interdisciplinary um, uh, elements and to see how AI is applied in manufacturing, like Jack mentioned and uh, Philip mentioned about the autonomous uh, cars. Now, the ethics, there are bodies right now, such as uh, the University of New York, who's looking at AI Now Institute, and they're in exceptional work on looking at the AI and its a social impact. Uh, in our societies. So they are um, providing some papers and recommendation on how to use AI uh, in the industries. So to come back to you, so where are we um, uh, on AI in the technology? So these are work going on right now at the every level, professional bodies. Um, I know that AIT is, is looking at uh, the, the impact of AI. We're looking at that as part of the digital panel. Um, the, um, like for example, the United Nations and in financial sector, uh, we're looking at that. Do you have um, many of the regulation bodies who are looking at the futures of, um, uh, of the, the finance sector and the future of banking 
And, um, and one of them is, for example, the Bank of England published a report, a very good report last year, on I think a year and a half ago, on uh, the impact of technologies in the financial sector. And one of them is the, uh, the application of AI in a financial sector and see how it will impact, for example, um, the credit rating, the application of algorithm. We talked about black boxes, the understanding of decision to be taken. So, Yes, so there's quite ethics is in a heart, but the good thing is many in institutions are currently working on that. There are developments carry on on this. And to finish on the ethics in AI, um, so it, now the importance is to prepare the future generation and Cambridge is launching its master in ethics in AI. And that shows that we, we arrive at a certain level of maturity that we can teach um, the practitioners on how to use um, the algorithm. And it's all of us as, as peers, it's, um, we will, we will help our peers as well um, to see how we can um, apply AI in our own industries. I hope that answers the question. It's been really long. But there's so much I wanted to say about the topic. <laughs> it, it is. If I could just jump in there, it is very interesting on who makes the rules. Um, Tim, you're talking about certification, who should make the rules? Well, again, sorry to go back to it, but it's the industry that we know. In the automotive industry, there's a concern that it will be the big OEMs that will make the rules about what this car does and who it runs over. You know, the, the, uh, the tram um, um, issue. And what we're seeing really in the automotive industry is the United Nations are stepping in. They have work package, we know it's a UNECE work package 29. And what that does is that does a lot in terms of taking the industry and breaking it down. So, uh, and, and looking at the certification. So at the moment, they've just started to look at um, cybersecurity in vehicles, and that's related um, to, um, uh, to artificial intelligence. The next step will be the introduction of what they're calling ALKS, which is lane keeping systems. And this is slow. Um, uh, this is when the vehicle is driving effectively in a traffic jam. And they're looking for coming up with regulations as to how that vehicle will, will behave in a very low safety environment, which is um, uh, a traffic jam. But it's good to see the United Nations um, taking a, a hold because I think it is the politicians and not the technologists that may have to have the input. Whatever we think about politicians, they are elected by us. And I think that uh, being able to involve them in the process of ethics rather than just the technologists is an important factor. Um, what I would say is just we are um, um, evolving and everyone has their input. So I think it's, it will be evolving and, and, um, and everyone's bringing their, their own thoughts and ideas about uh, how we can make it better. So I guess it's uh, the same thing as the way it was when the first cars were on the streets. Uh, it has evolved. Um, so when, then we have the, you know, the driving license and etc. So I think um, it, it's um, um, it's for all of us to to participate and trying to make our, our word better and our science better. That's that's why I think. I think so, but the uh, it's so often the case that the, the technology runs uh, faster than the regulation. And what you're describing about the UN being involved in the professional institutions, uh, uh, putting a lot of work into it. Uh, there's still a lot of distrust, I, I, I would say, about artificial intelligence. So, um, Nick, maybe I could ask you, is uh, our are people still wary? Is the, is the regulation enough in place or is uh, technology doing what it wants to do at the moment? So I, I think, Tim, there's, there's probably two dimensions to this. There's the question of, of what does industry do in terms of making a solution which is both effective and safe as well. Um, but then the other side of things is, is what is the, the user's take on this? What is the user's experience in terms of using this system which contains artificial intelligence and is in some way um, autonomous? And from a user perspective, you can define trust in, in, in three terms, or at least the product of three terms, reliability, predictability, and also explainability. Right. And you don't need all three all of the time, but it depends upon context. Right. So when we get onto a plane or when most people get onto a plane, 
Um, most people don't understand how the plane works. They don't necessarily understand the physics of it. They don't understand how the flight control system is operating and all of the software that sits behind that. But they still trust it because they've had many past experiences, they read the papers, and it's still the safest form of transport. In other words, they have a view of the reliability and the predictability of getting on an aeroplane, and therefore they trust that complex machine. The, the challenge is when you present a user with a new system for which that reliability and predictability data is either not available, or it is available, but not in a form that they can readily access as a user and understand from their user perspective. Uh, and that might be uh, like going back in time, maybe 15 or so years or maybe 20 years. Uh, and we saw some good sat navs starting to appear, which were, were used in, in, in automotive. But do you, did you always trust them? You know, when it gave you an instruction to say, uh, I'm taking you off the motorway now. And you think, well, why are you doing that? And because you couldn't interrogate the system, because you couldn't get the system to explain itself, to say to you that, look, there's roadworks up ahead. Uh, this time of day, there's usually an hour to an hour and a half delay. I'm going to take you off the motorway via some A roads. Nothing to worry about. No mountain passes, you know, for the, for the car to squeeze through and drive through rivers and all the rest of it. In which case, the user would go, OK, uh, let's give that a go. Um, because the system is able to explain itself, right? Over time, reliability and predictability from that user perspective will be built up. And, and it's important really to, to recognize that whilst industry will have, have gone to uh, various extremes to ensure that the system does exactly what it says on the tin and is safe to operate, that's not necessarily the user experience at that point in time. And therefore you've got to consider all of those particular facets. The risk, as we've seen already with uh, self-driving modes in, 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 in vehicles, is overtrust. So the, the human overestimates the capability of the machine because they're not necessarily engineers that are steeped in, uh, in this particular topic. And then under trust, whereby the, the user doesn't exploit the system to its full potential, right? And finding that right balance between under trust and over trust is, is absolutely critical and an area which requires much further research in what we might refer to as human machine teaming. Okay, all right. Thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on now away from the, from the trust issues uh, and on to uh, the impact on the workforce that AI is having. I'll, I'll start with you, Josh, if I, I may. The um, and uh, designers, uh, when they're designing AI into a product, you you are at uh, at MathWorks must deal with a, a lot of product designers, obviously. Are people uh, appreciating the the full potential of AI within their products? Perhaps as Nick has just was mentioning, sat navs and uh, and such like. I mean, yes, they are now, but actually I'd like to jump back a little bit in time to give you kind of a historical perspective. I think when we sort of first had deep learning, well, when we first had obviously machine learning and, and AI, it wasn't very common to use them in products because it wasn't as good as where it's got to today. And in fact, even as deep learning started to gestate and become more common, it was very much a computer science-y kind of thing. The tooling, the chains of things that you needed to join together didn't easily join together. And I think one of the core reasons why deep learning particularly has kicked off in the last five years or so is because there have been tool chains where the designer can work in their normal mode of operation in the, in the as Bill said, we want to do ground truth labeling. They know what their data looks like. They ingest their data. They label the ground truth in certain interesting ways. They then run it through AI systems. Those AI systems are trained on whatever the high performance computing or GPU systems that they've got. And then they can generate networks or AI systems that can then be put into the standard workflows for their cars, for their airplanes, for their banks or whatever else. And so I think it's really, really important that scientists and engineers have had the capability 
of being able to do AI. That's actually why it's been important and it's worked. It's because most people have been able to do it. And that's a really, really key thing for MathWorks particularly, but I think for many of us, is to be able to do that kind of thing and use the tools that we're used to. I actually like to come back to something Nick said really, really early on, which is often, even with sort of a deep learned system, you might constrain it with other types of AI or machine learned models. And I do think fusion of previous models that worked well in a product along with deep learned models so that you can get the best of both worlds is a very, very common tactic at the moment. Also, it helps with what Nick was just talking about, about explainability, because you can say it'll be no worse than the traditional model. But I do think that uh, the, the next phase, as Nick and Nadia were both pointing out, is that explainability of these models is going to be key to the user adoption of them. And certainly we're seeing product designers and, and scientists and engineers wanting more tooling in the explainability realm, because I, I'm going to take a slight issue, Nick, with something you said before. I don't think you can get away with no explainability. I think even in your oh, oh. aircraft example, someone can explain it. Often what I yes. think humans do is say, someone can explain it. It doesn't have to be me. And, and I, I perceive the real problem at the moment is at the moment, zero people can explain certain things. We need to get that zero to a small number. And at that point, your product of your three things becomes very, very reasonable. And I think there's a, a lot of tooling is needed in that area so that the vast growth in the types of AI model that we see out there can have both predictability, robustness, and explainability, at which point I do think users will then be comfortable taking it. And I think also going back to your point, once you have those, users have a reasonable way of guessing how good this model is and under what circumstances it will work. I do agree that that is the essential part of all AI models is being able to, the, the user being able to predict when it will actually work under those That's circumstances. Point, yeah, right. I'd, <clears throat> I'd agree with that, Joss, uh, completely, right? Like, so tools accessibility is the big thing that's driven people to start using machine learning in manufacturing processes. Um, and what, with that accessibility, and I mean, we're, we're not talking data scientists, we're talking machine builders that are going, I have a task that I was unable to achieve with traditional techniques, I can achieve that with machine learning. They're now starting to explore the, I have a task that I could achieve with traditional methods, but I may be able to achieve it more efficiently with machine learning. And that you can see that that um, not necessarily, uh, yeah, reliability, you yeah, know, not the, the three sort of tenets of trust that you mentioned, Nick, uh, are being there, but it's, it's purely that individual's experience and they're only able to gain that experience because the tools are accessible to them. They are their normal working environment. But I would have thought in the uh, in the environments uh, that you're talking about, that you're talking to engineers rather than when Josh is talking about the end, the user as being the end customer. You're talking about engineers, and I would have thought that uh, uh, the, the 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 fusion of AI ideas that Josh is talking about that's going to be uh, far more at home in uh, in that industrial environment than uh, the consumer environment. Uh, yes, except the the big difference is, is that the industrial environment, the the uh, the impact of mishaps is considerably worse than it is in the consumer environment. So, in fact, I actually tend to be more conservative in those regards, especially when um, you know, things get moved around in factories that you know, potentially land on people. They uh, you find that actually. Um, yeah, people are in fact yeah more risk averse than they would be with a piece of consumer technology, right? Like the the danger of your home being heated too much is that it's a bit warm and yeah you're you're not going to be able to set your house on fire by putting too much hot water in a radiator. Whereas in say like a soldering machine, you could cause some fairly catastrophic damages to it. Okay. All right. Can I stay with you, Jack? Because I got and and a, a similar sort of vein to what you've just touched on there. AI uh, 
some people would have an impression that it's going to have an impact on jobs. Uh, it's, it's going to replace jobs. It's going to create other jobs. What, what's your view in the engineering sector? What, what's the impact going to be on the workforce? Um, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think there's going to be an overnight, like, you know, swathes of redundancies because AI has come along and, you know, made machine operators redundant, right? That, that's, that's not going to, that's not going to happen. I think what is going to happen is the way people approach their work is going to change. I think people are going to question whether it is worthwhile um, engaging human intelligence to perform a particular task, whether, and, and it might not necessarily be, you know, cheaper, faster. It might be simply we can, we can do it slower, but we can keep it going 24 hours a day kind of thing. It might be that um, in that, that new, and yeah, it, it might be pretty, it might be that roles go towards producing like quality training data and stuff like that, rather than specifically, you know, working directly on machines. Um, and I think the, the kind of general knowledge of that, of how of, of what is potentially possible is is a big driver and something that's i mean lacking even in 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 engineers that i speak to today is like how exactly what is possible and how how can i use it to do what we're doing do what do what i currently do do you know the same process but better how, how can it improve things okay uh, uh, fair enough I, I think nick you uh you, in a, the previous correspondence, you said it's going to all be down to productivity. If AI can be used to uh, to enhance productivity, then uh, all well and good. But if it's not, then we're all going to be left behind. So there'll be less jobs anyway. So would that be a, 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 a fair summary of? So, so almost, Tim. Not 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 quite. So, um, but rather. Um, I think AI is really a tool, right? Uh, you know, so so there's two sides to, to AI. There's there's products that contain AI, uh, and there's also the process improvements that you can make using AI. In other words, how to do the engineering better, if you will. And I think for many of us in in tech jobs, we ignore artificial intelligence at our peril, right? So, so in other words, if you really want to improve productivity, you want to improve efficiency, effectiveness, and also, you know, what doesn't get uh, an, uh, an awful lot of uh, mention uh, just at the, at the moment in the context of AI is sustainability, because being more efficient reduces your energy consumption, right? So you can get more out of less, right? So that's a really important uh, dimension to, to consider uh, in, in all of this. Um, I, I do think that there, there are some... Um, uh, challenges uh, with respect to the whole skilling situation because um, we need to make sure that skills are accessible to all, to all of those, uh, those technologists, those engineers, the technicians and so on in the tech jobs so that they can start to look at using artificial intelligence in order to, to achieve those productivity gains. And, and, and if, if, if you don't, then the, you are at risk, I think, of being uh, left behind. Now, fortunately, as, as Joss mentioned uh, just, just earlier, there are some fantastic tools out there which are really democratizing access to, uh, to artificial intelligence. You know, we uh, saw one of the, the exercises that uh, myself and colleagues did recently with uh, Cranfield uh, University was to, to look at uh, when a jet engine might fail. So it was a regression type analysis. We, we generally, or the majority used uh, MATLAB uh, for that. And it is amazing what you can pick up in a couple of hours, you know, through the on-ramps online, which, which quite honestly, even just a basic understanding of artificial intelligence, you can be a, a, a reasonably competent user in perhaps a weekend, right? And, and so, so, you know, so there's no excuses really for getting left behind. Uh, everything is there, just have to use it. And if I could just add to that, um, my observation in looking at all of the things that both my company MathWorks have done with AI for ourselves and also what our customers have done with it, Almost all of them are of the form, something we couldn't do before. They are not of the form. It was something we did less efficiently. 
And so I do think in terms of your very first question, Tim, which is, is it going to take our jobs? My At least my conjecture right now is no, simply because it is increasing productivity, but it's increasing productivity by doing things we didn't know how to do, rather than doing something more efficiently that we already knew how to do. Now, that doesn't mean that at some point in the future, it might work out how to do things that we already do. I mean, you know, gosh, one day maybe it'll be able to code instead of me. Maybe that would be a good thing. Um, but right now it can't. And so it's it has extended our ability rather than made our ability more oh. efficient, would be my observation. I would add to that by saying the inclusion of that question on the um, on the email that went out before this uh, presentation caused a discussion in our office. And we found it very difficult to think of a technology that has actually reduced jobs. Now, from the Industrial Revolution onwards, it's very, very difficult to think of a technology. The only one that we could really think of was um, automated tills in supermarkets. And even then, um, we weren't sure that it would just be releasing staff to do more important things. So I don't know what uh, uh, Nick and uh, Josh said. Well, how about Philip? Uh, uh, Nick says you can uh, you can learn AI in a weekend. It's uh, it's easy. It's uh, good. I, get the, the I, I don't think it's quite what he said. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it is either. But the um, but the skills involved surely the, the the more advanced levels of creating and using AI are going to require quite a skill set in themselves. So uh, is that something that? Uh, you and your company are, are, are ready to embrace is, are, as is the training out there i mean they are yes you have to learn new technologies though um, from uh, different communication standards from things like can bus and flex rate bus all the way through to different programming languages you have to make the investments in learn the new technology and artificial intelligence is going to be the same we have to not only learn how to use it but also learn what scope it gives you you know we have a very we are, as a company, very focused on the idea of using artificial intelligence effectively to improve the process of test. And we know that we're not in the, in the business of developing artificial algorithms for self-driving. We're, we're looking specifically at a particular area. We know that we have to um, improve our understanding. As a company, uh, we've actually taken the decision to do that by acquiring other companies. So there's a, uh, there's a German company that we acquired um, to help us in that regard. And we've set up some initiatives in, uh, um, in Croatia. Um, but yes, all companies and all individuals, they're going to have to learn more about the technology. It's not possible just to rest on our laurels and say, well, we understand the technology of up to 2010. Um, we can carry on using those. No, we have to learn to understand what AI is, but make sure that we thoroughly understand what AI is. Yeah, and I think if I could just come in, uh, Tim, on, on on what Phil's just said, I, I think it, you know, it, it does depend very much on on what your employees are, are, are doing, you know, within a, an engineering organization, because, you know, uh, short courses might be fine and they may fit, fit the bill to provide a general awareness for the majority. Uh, but then the next level up, you, you may want uh, those to, those people to spend several weeks in terms of um, formalized training courses. Uh, and then you, you may even want to send uh, some of your employees on master's courses, such as the MSc in Applied Artificial Intelligence that we created with Cranfield University with uh, the blessing of the uh, Government Office for Artificial Intelligence, because we felt there was a, um, I guess, a, 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 a gap between the computer scientist view of artificial intelligence and the real world practitioners of what we might class as autonomy, right? And we wanted to, to find a way of bridging uh, those, those two. So I think, uh, I think you, you almost need this pyramid-like <clears throat> structure. I definitely agree with that, Nick. Um, I, I just wanted to say like the, uh, something that we saw early on was just the uh, speed of iteration that we would expect, you know, computer scientists to be achievable on, right? Like, you know, oh, we'll try something in a weekend. If it doesn't work, we'll just do it next weekend and, and we'll keep going until it works. Um, at the, the opposite end of that, we've got people who are building machines that are going to go out and be sold for, you know, a vast sum of money after that person's retired, right? Well, yeah, the, the, where the raw materials cost more than the lifetime earnings of an individual, right? There, the that speed of iteration, uh, and I've heard it very well described, uh, which is yeah, 
everyone else is measured twice, cut once. Software engineers are cut often, cut early. Um, and, and being able to take something from that, you know, very fast iterative process and turn it and manipulate it into a fashion that works over much slower processes, like, like the, the design of machines and things like that, and even buildings, um, is, is a challenge in itself and something that we need to get better at as technology generalists, not just as AI experts. Okay. I was, I was going to say, oh, Tim, if I could add one more thing, actually, I thought that was interesting. Um, it, you know, Nick, you'd, fairly, you'd mentioned earlier that we obviously have an on-ramp to those stuff, and that's like gets you the basics. We obviously have lots of um, examples, and one of the most useful things I've heard from people is where we've taken an example that applies to one area and show how you apply it to others. And I do think one of the very interesting things about AI and the way that we train up our workforce has been about how to show people how to adapt AI from some relatively unrelated area like image processing into signal processing where you do a Fourier transform and you now have what looks like a picture. And I think one of the trends that we've always seen in AI is the adaption of techniques from unrelated areas to other ones and particularly ways of training people to do it are to put out lots of examples of look you could do something like this look you could do something like that look how signals look like images look how words look like vectors and having making people understand the relationships between areas has allowed people to develop techniques in ai cross area and i do think that's a really important aspect of the training that we need to do for our uh, systems engineers, our machinists, and our, even our um, financial institutions. I think there are many scenarios, Nadia, where I've seen this work in finance as well. Well, if we could go on to, to take up on that, that theme, that information, uh, information uh, exchange aspect of things. Um, I, I think maybe I'd, I'll ask, uh, in particular, the, the dual use of robust technology. Ask, ask uh, Nick about this one, because uh, there's technology being produced by BAE that could be perhaps used in other non-competitive applications. Um, and we need to get this information, uh, this sort of information, this skill set out to particularly SMEs, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the defence industry is naturally conservative because we, we we have to be we concern ourselves with the the impact of of things going wrong and and we need to absolutely make sure that all of those risks are are, are mitigated that generally means we produce systems which are exceptionally robust uh, capable at the task and we spend a lot of time concerning ourselves with verification, validation, qualification and certification and a whole range of different ways of doing that including for advanced forms of, of artificial intelligence and, and believe it or not for some types of uh, black box neural network um, examples we, we, we have uh, solutions uh, for formally uh, proving that they are are safe to to operate right and we've been doing that sort of thing for for several years so we see a, a number of things that we're we're working on with with potential for wider exploitation paths so the virtual cockpit that we're developing for the next uh, sorry the virtual cockpit and the virtual assistant that we are generating for the uh, next generation fighter program in in the uk is essentially a robust and safe virtual assistant because it has to be. It's informing a pilot uh, and enabling that pilot to make better, faster decisions. That sort of thing has application, and this is speculative, and this is this is opinion at the moment, uh, but but could have application within healthcare, within a home care where perhaps you need something much more robust than perhaps the systems that we we see. Uh, from the tech giants, which are useful if you want to order some shopping, but but for working out whether uh, a grandparent has, has fallen over and are in is in is in pain, and we need to absolutely get someone round there, then you're going to need something a whole lot more robust in those circumstances with all of the sensing suites that come with all of all of that, and and, and maybe an example which um, which which isn't purely 
artificial intelligence, but if you take augmented reality, so this idea that we provide information um, through, um, uh, through a computing device, through ultimately a, a, a display, sometimes those displays are see-through, and we provide a, a layer of information. It was, it was the military that developed augmented reality over 100 years ago. Right, people kind of taking a short uh, breath at that point, but they were developed as gun sites, ultimately augmented reality. Uh, over the following decades, they were developed into head up displays, into helmet mounted displays and so on. And then eventually we, 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 we just about started to see commercial augmented reality products, which are reasonably useful, right? Um, so one of the things that we did several, several years back, well, I'm going back to maybe 2013 now, was to take the very best virtual reality, so closed headset virtual world um, that was out there and put cameras on the front, you know, typical webcams to create what we called mixed reality. So a, a solution back in 2013 that could turn any environment into a, into a rich, real and virtual set of highly integrated, highly interactive types of environments. We did that for a cockpit and we did that also for a, a command center. As we develop those technologies going forwards, we expect various elements of that tech to spin back out into the commercial sectors and we restart this virtuous uh, circle. Now, obviously, that's a, a quite a lengthy scale in terms of the AR to VR to mixed reality journey. Uh, but for artificial intelligence, we can expect those virtuous circles to occur significantly faster. Okay, so Philip, would you see uh, a company like yours being a, a part of that virtuous circle in the uh, in the, uh, the supply chain in in a, a way of uh, disseminating all that information for uh, for SMEs in particular? Sorry, Philip, you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, we were an SME ourselves once, and so I think it's important um, to be able to get the information down to um, companies that have fewer resources and fewer capabilities. Um, uh, I mean, we at DSpace, we're not perhaps offering the kind of training courses um, that companies like the MathWorks would offer. We tend to offer the training courses um, in the use of the technologies that we use rather than uh, a, a more broader um, uh, a, a more broader sense um, I, I think it's I, I think really what we find important is a thorough understanding of the technology from the people who use it um, one of the points that Joss made before is you don't have to fully understand everything to use it but it helps so the analogy that Nick gave with the aircraft you know when you get on an aircraft uh, do you know how that thing works? Well, yeah, perhaps to fly on the aircraft, you don't need to know how well or how the aircraft works, but perhaps to use the aircraft for your own purposes, um, that is something that you need. And so it's the same with artificial intelligence. To use it to your own purposes and use it effectively, you need to have a thorough understanding and companies like ourselves um, are, are there to help you get that understanding. Okay. All right, I'm going to round up uh, now. I'm going to ask each of you uh, in turn to, to give uh, a, a top tip for somebody who's, who's looking to uh, progress down the road of AI uh, and do you take their first steps in it. I'll ask you each to, to give uh, one tip for those, for those sorts of companies. Maybe I could start with you, Nadia. Right, so a couple of things I wanted to say. So first of all, uh, for a company or an, inst an institution who would like to um, use artificial intelligence for resolving a problem, I think it's important to understand the, um, the, the, the level of maturity of the company in the sense of um, their, their technology implementations and their understanding of their data, as I mentioned earlier. Um, as I mentioned as well, some startups, for example, AI is part of their business process, is part of their DNA, whereas probably other companies 
who are trying to use AI is to, to resolve a specific problem. So I think it's important to understand that. The scalability as well. So if we look at some practical example to see how you want to prototype it, how you want to uh, make sure that it is scalable um, for your industry and have a strategy, a long-term strategy. And, um, and as we said early on, AI is not here to resolve every problem. Sometime other technologies um, will be able to help you. That is from a strategy company uh, level. Now for the staff working in the company, I think AI, we, we mentioned about AI in computer science or AI within Jack mentioned about the manufacturers looking at the AI side. And I'm glad you, you raised that point because I personally think that AI is going to be belonging to everyone. And we will have to give the same level of, um, of uh, quality of training to all of the individuals. And for me, I think it's important that going forward for industries, you will have hybrid uh, background, people from uh, an industry and an AI background. And that's why I always define myself as, al although I'm an AI scientist, uh, computer science, but I'm as well, I'm from the banking industry. So I focus on AI in the financial industry. Um, and then it's the evolution of the future of the finance. And I think industries are evolving like this as well, unless as uh, Jack mentioned, and then you mentioned as well, Nick related to uh, the master that is, uh, um, that you've been working on. So AI is not only for computer scientists and it's going to, it's for everyone. Now we have to make sure that we train people properly um, and they have the understanding of what can and can't be done. So I know you said one point, and then there's another element regarding AI in general, we saw about the evolution, and that's why I said earlier on, history is important. We started AI with least um, expert system. Now we're talking about Python. We're evolving. There's some limitation that we have. There are going to be more languages going forward, um, which are going to be resolving the AI problem of the future. So I think the important thing to keep is to stay flexible, open-minded, and see how AI is evolving, and then um, to follow that evolution. And I think that's the point that Josh mentioned as well um, about the evolution and how we're combining certain uh, key elements together. And um, so, yes, and it's, it's going to open new opportunities, definitely. So for industry and for AI in general, that's my thoughts. But just going back to your second point there, you're saying that AI should perhaps be a, a module within any, uh, any formal degree, whether it's uh, an engineering technology degree or not. Everybody should, uh, should have a basic understanding what AI could do. Uh, yes. I, this is one of the reasons why I went into education now, and I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this, uh, this amazing uh, opportunity is on trying to train um, not on people who are already working in industries, but who are interested to see how to use AI, and that's what is opening opportunities. So personally, when we talk about the future of the workforce, we're developing new type of jobs, we're developing new type of uh, skills as well, and that's why, as I said, I always specified that we are going to be expert in two fields, your industry and AI and, and how AI is applied in your industry. And that covers your regulations, your um, uh, the, the ethics questions that we had, and as well, the productivity in your industry. So yes, it is important personality. That's how I see it moving forward. Brilliant. Thanks, Nadia. You're welcome. We're doing it in strict order. Nick, you're next. One top tip for somebody looking to get into AI. Yeah, shorter than mine. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I took too long. No, but I, I, so I, I, I thought your, your your idea of 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 you know almost making it compulsory that there's a module on you know every undergraduate uh, course to explain AI. I think is 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 absolutely spot on, and and you know I'd love to see that happen and. Maybe the government office for, for AI can encourage academic institutes to make that make that happen. Um, so, so I think uh, the the one tip. Well, I kind of sum the one tip up in a word, which is leverage. I think you know whether you're a, a big company, a small company, uh, an individual, or an organisation. I think there's a vast array of material out there that can be leveraged. You know, from you know easy to utilise tools through to 
uh, AI within process improvement, uh, the technologies that can go into uh, a product and the intellectual property. And, and I think there's, there's, there's much greater scope for relationships between SMEs and large organizations where the large organizations can provide, you know, the rigor, the, the process, the access to market and, and all these sorts of things that, that an SME might, might need, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and in, in return, the, 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 the big organizations get access to cutting edge tech, you know, in an agile organization, which, you know, SMEs can be uh, much more uh, agile. And therefore I, I think, it's a it's a leveraging ecosystem. So turn it into two words, I guess. Right. Okay. Thank you, Josh. So let's assume you're already doing the leveraging ecosystem that Nick's talking about. Okay. So then you're new to AI. So I mean, my my top tip would be don't be afraid. But also, therefore, think about what success looks like. And I think actually we can refer back to Nick and a number of people who were saying, you know, you need robustness, predictability, and understandability. So as you run through whatever it is that you have chosen to set your first AI topic on, think about those things as you run through it. Don't just go, let's just throw data at a model and it's going to work, right? Because that's not going to work. So what you want to do is think about explainability, predictability, and robustness as you are generating and doing what it is, whatever it is you're going to do. Because let's assert that as a company, you are probably going to have to do AI, right? It would appear, looking at industry, at the evolution of AI, everyone is seeing a degree of success in it. Therefore, you have to work out as a company how to make your company successful. And if you fail to make your company successful with AI, well, okay, there is the possibility that your company doesn't need AI, but more likely is you haven't gone down a path that's allowed your company to develop AI in a business sense that works for you. So therefore, you should think about these criteria and how to raise them from their zero level to a level that you are comfortable with so that you can then become successful with AI. Hence, leverage, right? You learn lots of stuff. You have a tool chain that fits together. All the things that can get you from zero to comfortable would be important things to do. So it's not just being brave to start with it's carry on being brave if it's not work first time yes you must not only yes you must if at first you don't succeed you should undoubtedly try again and you should acknowledge that maybe you don't know enough about what you're doing to try it a different way but hopefully if you are leveraging the best of breed of models of techniques of ground truth labelings and whatever you can bring it to bear on the problem that you've set it and so often we find people trying small ai projects and they use a small ai project just to become comfortable with the concepts they become comfortable with the techniques they become comfortable with how it flows through from beginning inception to end and deployment at which point they become way more comfortable as a company to then run through much more significant AI problems and hopefully use Phil's verification tools at the end and things like that. So that's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Jack? Um, my one word of advice would be agility. Um, like, stay agile. As Joss has said, right? like, dip your toe, do a small project, don't get bogged down in the fact that it is going to have to scale across, you know, your entire product range if you make products or your entire service range, if that's that's your business's thing. Um, so dip your toe, but have a route to scale. Don't try and dip your toe and then deploy it across your entire workforce. Um, have, you know, go up in orders of magnitude, plan, you know, don't get bogged down in it, but have a route out of it as well. Okay, thank you. And Philip? I would say um, if you're going to release your artificial intelligent project into the wild, don't underestimate the value of test. When I started out as a graduate engineer, I was surprised to find that there was an expectation in embedded systems that 70% of your resources would be dedicated to test. Um, and throw everything that you can at it. Don't be frightened. Like Josh says, don't be afraid, but don't be frightened to throw the kitchen sink and everything at it. If you don't break it, somebody else will. And when they do break it, they're gonna ask you why it broke. And the only way that you can know that is by understanding um, 
really what it can do. Now, the, one of the facets of artificial intelligence, as has been said in this meeting, is um, perhaps there are some occasions where we don't understand it. Well, if you're going to release it into the wild, you need to have a level of understanding. All right. Well, that has been brilliant, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your in insightful contributions. We've just drifted a shade over an hour. Sorry about that. Um, but thank you all very much. And for all those viewing, I hope you uh, find this uh, an interesting debate. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.